Well, good morning, everyone. It's been a blessing to be with you this morning. Encouraging service. It, I feel like we say it every week, but it's amazing how well the songs and the prayers and the lesson and the class all tie together somehow. And we shouldn't be surprised at that because, um, like I'm trying to get across in the One God, One Story series, the Bible really is one story and it's about one God who, uh, who has a purpose to redeem one race, mankind, mankind, all, all of us humans. And, and uh, so uh, the fact that everything ties together with that theme shouldn't be a surprise to us, but it's still neat when it does. And as Tim was praying such a beautiful prayer, I was thinking about uh, the things that we talked about in class and the things that, uh, that I have planned to talk about and the songs that we sang. And as we sung the song before the Lord's Supper, especially that Dylan led us in so powerful and, uh, and lots to tie in with what we're going to talk about in our, in our lesson this morning as well. So it's encouraging uh, to be together. Uh, I know we're all worried about Al. And Al, if you're watching on the live stream, which I think you are, you are certainly in our prayers. Already prayed for you this morning and uh, definitely on our minds here this morning that you know, you'll heal quickly. But, uh, but in any case, it's encouraging to gather together. And, and we're blessed by that opportunity this morning. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philemon. To the book of Philemon, that's where our lesson will come from this morning. It's a pretty small book, but it has a lot to teach us. And lately I've been thinking about the way that being a Christian affects our entire life. It changes every aspect of the way we live. I think something that I struggle with consistently, I don't know about you, but at least for me, I struggle with compartmentalizing my faith kind of putting it into a box. I, I'm very cognizant and aware of the fact that I'm a Christian when I'm gathered with the saints on, on Sunday morning, uh, much more so. Uh, or when I offer prayer before a meal and I'm praying to God, uh, yeah, I, I'm cognizant of, of my faith in Jesus and in God. Or, or when I'm doing some Bible reading in my personal devotional life. It's easy to be aware and cognizant of the fact that I'm a Christian. That's who I am. That's why I'm talking to God. That's why I'm reading His Word. That's, that's why I'm here this morning. And those are great reminders of the fact that we are followers of Jesus. But on the other hand, when I'm talking with a friend just day to day or when I'm out to eat or maybe when I was working for the company that I worked for this, earlier this year and um, was at my desk just sitting doing work Monday to Friday, um, probably a lot less likely to have the fact that I'm a Christian in mind. Not that I never did, but it's harder. It's just harder. And maybe you find that to be true for you. Maybe you're like me and you kind of sort of tend to own a different identity depending on where you are. You know, saying, well, this is who I am when I'm in this place. Like, when I'm at work, I'm a videographer. And then when I'm at home, I'm a husband. And when I'm with a friend, I'm one of the guys. When I'm at this building, I'm, I'm one of the members of Christ's church. And maybe you think that way too. Sometimes we have that kind of tendency. And on the surface, there may not seem to be a, like a huge problem with that way of thinking. But I'd suggest to myself and to you all this morning that such thinking might be more har harmful and less scriptural than we sometimes realize. See, it doesn't seem so harmless when we think of this only in theoretical terms of just how we kind of look at ourselves from an identity standpoint. But in actuality, the way we view ourselves it doesn't just affect the way we think and our thoughts. It also affects what we do and how we live. It affects our decision-making and our actions. And our decision-making and our actions, and even our thoughts as well, affect our souls. That's just a fact. And so, for example, if I'm at work, and the way I view myself there is, I'm just a video producer, just a videographer. Maybe I don't pipe up when religious discussion comes up and there's an opportunity to share the truth of the gospel. Because, well, I'm, I'm here just to work and get a paycheck. And, you know, I, I don't want to throw a kink in to my relationships here. And I, I'm just doing a job. I found myself thinking that way before. Or, or maybe I'm out to eat and I think of myself as just the customer here who deserves to get his money's worth out of the meal that he's paying way too much for because of all this inflation, right? But... Maybe I need to recognize that I'm not just a customer. I am a Christian customer. And the truth is that for Christians, if our lives are a pie, which, ooh, a pie. But no, if, if our lives are a pie, uh, Christianity isn't just a slice of the pie. Our faith isn't just a little sliver. Our, our faith, our, our Christianity is the pie. It is the essence of who we are if we are truly in Christ. And you may be wondering, 
yeah, that's true, but what does Philemon have to do with all this? Well, Philemon is a more personal letter than any other in the New Testament. And the reason I say that is because it's the only one that's directed primarily at a person, at a specific individual. So that makes it unique. And in speaking to this individual, Philemon being that individual, Paul, the writer, gives us a picture of what it actually means to live out our faith in everyday matters. Gives us a picture of what it really means to be a Christian in the day-to-day. I think that's powerful. I'll admit that in times past, I thought the book of Philemon was just more of like a pragmatic matter of Paul telling Philemon, this is how you need to handle this runaway slave, and and maybe some spiritual discussion in there to kind of frame this context. And that could be helpful since Paul was an apostle and an inspired writer, and Onesimus was with him. But I was recently given a book that was written by one of my professors in college, David McClister, and that book has helped me realize, as I've continued to study the the book of Philemon, that the letter to Philemon is less about dealing with those logistics of a runaway slave. We don't even know for sure that that's what Onesimus was, as it turns out, which I didn't even realize. But it's less about that, those logistics of a runaway slave, and more about how the gospel compels us to change our way of thinking. Our actions, our decisions, and really our entire lives, we have to change so that they're brought in step with the gospel. Specifically, the book of Philemon focuses on relationships. And there are two main characters that Paul addresses in this letter. There's Philemon, the recipient of the letter. And then there's Onesimus, who is the subject matter of the epistle. And as Paul writes, he addresses the relationship between both of these parties and how they're interconnected in light of the fact that both are now Christians. And that makes a difference. He shows us that uh, these people and their relationships are changed by Christ. And he deals very practically with how that plays out in their lives. And so in Philemon verses 8 through 11, we get a picture of this as Paul writes to Philemon and says, beginning in verse 8 of the book of Philemon, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. So we're going to look at the book of Philemon this morning as we consider how the relationships we have are transformed when we are in Christ. But before we can look at how relationships with others are transformed in Christ, we have to look at how being in Christ means transformation for each of us as individuals when we come to Christ. And the book of Philemon shows us this. In verse 11, it talks about Onesimus and the change that has occurred in him. Formerly, he was useless to Philemon, but now he is indeed useful to both Philemon and to Paul. And so this shows us the fundamental truth that coming to Christ involves a willingness to change. There's a whole lot we don't know about Onesimus' past, and people have guessed a lot about that. Lots of conjecture out there about his, his past history with Philemon, even specifically. But what we do know is that he was a bondservant, essentially a slave. He was a slave. And as Paul describes him in verse 11, he says that Onesimus was useless to Philemon in his past. So that we do know. And we could speculate a great deal about what this means, and lots of people have spilled a lot of ink conjecturing things like the possibility that he was a rebellious slave while working for Philemon, and then he ran away, and so he's this runaway slave, or some people just wonder if he was just lazy in his work, or dishonest, or all kinds of things. But the truth is, we don't really know about that. What we do know, however, is what Paul tells us in verse 11, that Onesimus was formerly useless to Philemon, but now he is useful. Not only to Philemon, but to Paul as well. And he was useful to Paul, not only in a physical way, but in a way that served the gospel. You see that in verse 13. And what this shows us is that there was a change in Onesimus. Something has changed for his life. And it's affected Onesimus greatly. So much so that this change in his life even trickles down to just the duties he performs as a servant. It's changing the way he serves. Wow. He's gone from being useless, verse 11 tells us, to being extremely useful. So much so that that Paul doesn't want to let him go. He wants to keep him with him. But he only lets him go because he believes it to be the right thing to do as a Christian. So what kind of major life decision could possibly bring about this kind of radical life change in even the life of a slave? 
I mean, even in the Greco-Roman world, it's not like the slavery we think of that existed in our country, but still, there wasn't much hope for a slave to have a better life. There wasn't much promise of something better tomorrow. They were about the lowest on the social ladder in the Hellenistic world that you could be. So what could possibly affect such drastic change for Onesimus? What could motivate him to, to change like this? Well, we know exactly what kind of life decision can bring that about. It's the decision to give yourself to Christ that can do that. Obeying the gospel and becoming a Christian means big changes in who you are and therefore in the way that you live. And we know this. But Onesimus is a prime example of this. I think a lot of times it's easy for us to reduce obeying the gospel to an intellectual exercise. It's just something we do in putting our faith in Jesus, and in return we get this reward of heaven. And sometimes we think or we even act like that's... All there is to that is just an equation. But Onesimus is a real-life example of someone who got to learn about the true nature of the gospel from an apostle, an apostle of Jesus, who also happened to be the most prolific author of New Testament writings. And in the letter to Philemon, we get a small picture of what the results of that looked like in Onesimus' life. And I think that's neat. For Onesimus, becoming a Christian clearly was not a transactional, intellectual exercise that, that didn't affect him that much. This decision changed the very fabric of who he was and how he lived each moment that he was given. And I'm reminded of Paul's words in another letter he wrote, this one, to the Ephesians. And you may recognize this kind of language, but in Ephesians chapter 4, he says in verse 20 of Ephesians 4, "...but that is not the way you learned Christ." Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And we're familiar with this concept of putting off the old self, or the old man, some translations would say, and putting on the new self, or the new man. What I at least had forgotten about this text is just how direct Paul is in what he says here. He doesn't mince words. He says, that's not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. Whoa! <laughs> it's almost like Paul saying, hey, this is basic gospel teaching about what it means to follow Jesus. I mean, you did actually learn about Jesus, right, when you became a Christian. It's, okay, Paul, yeah, okay, we got it. But the point is, this is so essential to the gospel of Christ that we can't afford to miss it. And if you didn't get this, you didn't really get the gospel. It takes up very few words to state this principle, but the application of this is so important and it reaches very far down. It reaches far wide and it reaches even deep into every aspect of our lives. And Onesimus is a living example of this part of the gospel taking root in him and being lived out. There was a former Onesimus, and now there is a new Onesimus. And the two are different people. And this old Onesimus and the new Onesimus <laughs> are not only different in what they believe intellectually about the validity of Jesus and who he was, but they're clearly different in just the way they live. They're different people in the way that their actions play out day to day. Even down to the way he serves, being a slave, everything has changed for Philemon. Or excuse me, for Onesimus. I knew I was going to do that at some point. <laughs> Paul says that Onesimus has gone from useless to Philemon to being useful both to Philemon and to himself. And even though there may be a cost of time or energy or perhaps even more involved in this for Onesimus, Onesimus is now willing to serve and is useful in a way that he just wasn't before. So why does Paul say in Ephesians that this idea of changing and putting off the old self and on the new self is such a, a key and basic principle about following Jesus? It's because ultimately this change boils down to acknowledging Jesus' kingship, acknowledging who Jesus is. And this is kind of where this ties into these lessons we've been considering about the kingdom and then last week about the king himself. Because if, if somebody's going to follow Jesus, what they must necessarily do is submit every aspect of their lives to his authority and to his kingship. That's what it means to follow him. No longer does Onesimus get to decide how he works and serves. Jesus does. Jesus decides that. No, no longer do we get to decide how we're going to work and how we're going to live and how we're going to act. Jesus gets to decide that. I don't. And we can see this in the fact that Paul refers to Jesus as Christ seven times in this really short letter to Philemon. 
And considering the brevity of this letter, this is a big deal. Let me explain. In our day and age, the term Christ has sort of come to be a, uh, synonymous with the name Jesus, as if it's just like a surname for Jesus, and it's just something we call him when we, when we want to change things up. If you were to you know, refer to me as, hey, Sneed, you know, and, okay, I get that. It's just another way to call me. That's not the way it is with the terms Jesus and Christ. What we need to understand is that the name Christ means something more. It's actually a title for Jesus. The Christ, we've heard that phrase. When we call him the Christ, we are calling him the Messiah or the King. And ultimately what we do when we call him Christ is that we emphasize his kingship or his reign. And so the fact that Paul calls Jesus Christ so much in this letter points us to the fact that following Jesus and coming to Christ means acknowledging his kingship and his right to reign over something as vast as the universe. He reigns over that. But he also has a right to reign over something as deep and personal as each and every decision that we make. We see this in Onesimus. And it's a good reminder that when people come to Christ, there's a lot of change that has to happen. That's the nature of becoming a Christian. Becoming a Christian isn't just a matter of saying, yeah, I believe Jesus existed. I believe he's God's son. Sure. And then accepting your reward of heaven. It's a matter of submitting your entire life and every decision you make to the kingship and to the authority of Jesus. And this is hard. If you're thinking, man, that's intense, it's because it is. It's difficult. It's why many people walk away and decide they just don't want to follow Jesus. Like the rich young man in Mark chapter 10. He, he, this guy kept all the basic commands of the old law. He had, he'd done it. But Jesus called this man to submit everything to his kingship even the wealth that this young man clearly prized so much. And Jesus required him to change his way of thinking and therefore to change his actions and decisions and the way he lived, the way he used his money even, was to be under Jesus' kingship. And he just wasn't willing to do that. So that's a negative case study of this principle. But Onesimus is a positive case study of this principle. He was willing to submit everything he was, everything he did and everything he had to Christ's reign in Christ's rule. And in doing so, he was blessed. And so was Paul. And so were others in the household of God. So this is what it looks like to come to Jesus. A person is called to submit their lives to Jesus and to change whatever there is about their life that is not in submission to him. That's what it means to become a Christian. Maybe we forget that sometimes. At least, at least I know I lose sight of that from time to time. And so what Paul tells us and shows us by his words to Philemon is that just as the person who is converted to Christ has undergone a change, there is also a change that must take place in those of us who are Christians already as well. And we see this in Onesimus and Philemon and their relationship. Because when Onesimus came to Christ, the way Philemon viewed him had to change as well. And we see this in what Philemon is called to by the gospel, which Paul reminds him of in this letter, especially in what he says to Philemon about Onesimus in verses 15 through 17 of this letter. Uh, let's read, starting in verse 15 of Philemon. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Paul says that Onesimus, he's more than a bondservant now. He's more than that. The way that Philemon is to view Onesimus is going to be different now that he's in Christ. That changes things. And this is a big deal. Like a really big deal, especially when you look at the context of the world in which this was taking place. Consider the fact that the Hellenistic world was really focused on the idea of status. They prized status. This was a big deal to them. A person's status had a whole lot to do with how they were viewed, how they were treated, how they were dealt with in transactions and, and things like that. And then consider what would have been the difference in Philemon and Onesimus' statuses. A pretty wide gap there. Philemon, on the one hand, has a slave. He owns a slave. He's got a house large enough to host a local church, we find out in verse 2. He's someone Paul is hoping to stay with at some point as well, which we read in verse 22. And Philemon likely would have had significant status in the time in which he lived. And we can kind of see that from these clues in this letter. But then on the other hand, you got Onesimus. Onesimus didn't own slaves. He was a slave. He didn't own property. He was a slave to someone who did. 
And so this, as we previously discussed, would have put him pretty close to the bottom of the social status ladder in the Greco-Roman world. And yet, while Paul is not saying that in Christ all these existing social conditions are just wiped away, and Onesimus the slave no longer has any kind of an obligation to Philemon his master, otherwise this letter would read very differently or wouldn't exist at all, it doesn't wipe that away or erase it, but what Paul is saying is that in Christ Onesimus is transformed into something altogether different, and that Philemon needs to view him that way, first and foremost. He's not saying Onesimus is no longer a slave, but he's very much saying his identity is in Christ, and as such, Philemon needs to view him through the lens of being in Christ. And he needs to see him as a brother in the Lord. And that's a big change. But not only is he now called by the gospel to view Onesimus as a brother, Paul takes it a step further, and he actually says, Philemon, you need to view him as a beloved brother. He modifies that. It's not just a brother. You need to love him. And in saying this, it kind of calls back to the love that Paul has already mentioned in verses 5 and 7. He's already said there's an abundant love in Philemon. Philemon said to, to have great love for the Lord Jesus. He said to have great love for all the saints. And Paul himself says he's been a beneficiary of Philemon's love for Christ and of the brethren, as he's been comforted and given joy through this love that Philemon has. And Paul also says that the hearts of all the saints have been refreshed through Philemon himself. This is a beautiful thing. It's what the gospel should do for us, but guess what? It applies to Onesimus now as well. This is new. If he's going to live out the gospel, all the love that Philemon has for his Savior and for his brethren and the church that meets in his house and his brethren the world over, it's all going to go to Onesimus as well now. His slave is going to get that love. That's a pretty transformed relationship by the gospel. And Philemon is the kind of person in whom Paul clearly has a lot of confidence. He says, I know that you'll do this. But yet he's writing to remind him of this for his benefit and for ours as well. Uh, but, but he trusts Philemon to act this way upon receiving Onesimus as a new convert to Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's all because of the gospel. It's because of the kingship of Jesus. Don't lose that thought. It's because of Jesus' kingship and how it affects the lives of of true disciples of him who were submitted to his reign. But guess what? They weren't the only disciples of Jesus. We're disciples of Jesus too, right? So this has some applications for us, very real applications for us. And so what I'd suggest to you along the way of application is that first of all, being in Christ must continue to transform and control every aspect of our lives. Just as coming to Jesus isn't just this intellectual exercise of acknowledging that Jesus, he, he existed, and then he's the Son of God, I would say. Uh, though that is, of course, you know, you've got to have that when you're converted. You must acknowledge that. But following Jesus for the rest of our lives isn't just an exercise in ritual church attendance and prayer before meals. Following Jesus is a matter of complete and total submission to his kingship. That's what it means to follow Jesus. He's king. That's what the gospel tells us. Jesus reigns, and if we're going to obey the gospel, we must submit to that. And just as for Onesimus, coming to Jesus meant changing the way he treated his role as servant or as a slave. Being disciples of Jesus has got to change the way we view our role as employees and workers in our jobs. And just as Onesimus went from a useless slave to a useful Christian, do we look more like dedicated, God-honoring workers? Or do we still resemble more like the old man of a lazy sluggard who does the bare minimum? Are our relationships with our friends and family transformed into relationships that first and foremost live out the gospel in an effort to encourage those who are Christians and to bring those who are not to Christ? Would have been a whole lot easier for Onesimus to just start worshiping with this church that's in Philemon's home, but just still work the way he used to and keep on going with business as usual and, and say and do the things he used to say and do as Philemon's slave. But clearly that's not what the gospel called him to. Called him to change. I mean, for that matter, it, it would have been easier for him to just not go back to Philemon at all, right, if he, if he wasn't going to change. It would have been easier for him to stay where Paul was and show up at the assembly there and, and keep doing his thing without ever even going back at all. And you know what? For those of us who are Christians, it's still easier to show up on Sundays and do the church thing and then do our thing the rest of the week. Just as true now as it was then. But there's one thing wrong with that. That's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. 
The gospel is a call to surrender our lives entirely to Jesus because we recognize that he's the rightful king of them anyway. And the truth is, if we're honest with the gospel message, then we're going to realize that after becoming Christians, we don't get to just decide what we want to do ever again. We don't. We don't get to decide, oh, this, is what I, this is what I want to do, that's what I'm going to do. It's Jesus. It's our king who dictates our actions and our decisions. And not only does he dictate where we are on Sunday mornings at 1030, but he dictates where we are, what we do, who we are, what we say, who we spend our time with, and what our attitude is, and everything about us, 24 hours, 7 days a week. There's a hymn we sing here quite often that I don't know that I'd ever sung before, uh, before coming here. And it's the hymn Living for Jesus that's our invitation song. If you want to open up there, we'll kind of take a look at some of those lyrics. The first few times I sung it, I thought, hey, that's, that's a good sentiment. We're, we're all trying to live for Jesus. And plus, it's got some nice barbershop-style chords in there. You know, I'm a big fan of that. So, it's, yeah, it's a cool song. And then as I started preparing this lesson, I started thinking about that song. The more I thought about it, all of a sudden I realized I had no idea what I was actually singing. How many times do we do that with songs <laughs> where we sing it all our lives and then all of a sudden, whoa, something happens and it makes us actually read it. <laughs> Say, whoa, there's a lot there that I never realized. And it's just another one of those songs that's so rooted in scripture and every line points us to a different text. And, and what I want us to see, though, in, in the song is that it talks pretty directly about surrendering everything to Jesus. Everything to Jesus. Let's, let's consider the lyrics together for a moment. Verse 1, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, that's like to a king, right? Glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing for me. In verse 2, living for Jesus who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer His call. And what is His call? Follow His leading and give Him my all. And then the chorus, O Jesus, Lord, talks about his kingship, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. Not my Sundays, I, I give myself to thee. For thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. That's the kingship again. My life I give. Henceforth to live, O Christ, the King, for thee alone. I thought, wow, I missed a lot there. <laughs> but the kingship of Christ and our call to submit entirely and totally to him is all over this thing. <laughs> As I'm rereading it and, and looking at it, what I hope we see is, is, is that that is exactly what this small but powerful picture of Onesimus shows us about the nature of the gospel call, which remains just as true for us longtime Christians as it does for babes in Christ. The gospel is that Jesus is king, and instead of having to be fearful of that, we can rejoice at that because he's offered us all a way to submit to him with our uh, past rebellion forgiven and forgotten. And you might say this is the vertical dimension of being in Christ. We are now submissive to Jesus as king in all that we do, and so we bring ourselves under his reign. And this is absolutely key to being true followers of Jesus. But one final application for you this morning is that what the book of Philemon also shows us, maybe even more powerfully, is that there's also not only a vertical dimension, but a horizontal dimension to being in Christ. And what that means is that just as Philemon was compelled by the gospel to view Onesimus differently, when people come to Christ in our day and time, we have to view them differently too. Now, I'll tell you right now, guilty as charged of not doing that. This lesson is stomping all over my toes. Especially in America, we tend to identify people by their jobs or by their degree of self-reliance. And while certainly the Bible commands us to work, I mean, that's, we ought to do that and shouldn't be sluggards. But at the same time, the Christian's identity is not in his job like it is in America. And as we look at each other, we need to realize that. That doesn't mean we should all quit our jobs. Just as the fact that Onesimus' identity was no longer a slave didn't mean he could quit serving his master and run off and do whatever he wanted to do. What it does mean is that as we look at each other, we have to stop looking at our fellow Christians through the lens of their identity outside of Christ. And instead, we have to see them as just our brothers and sisters in Christ. In our society, we place value on certain jobs, for instance. Maybe a brother has a job that isn't highly valued by the world, like a garbage worker. But you know what? 
The gospel calls us to view that brother not as the world would see him, but through his new identity as a brother in Christ. And you know what, though? That goes both ways. If you're the brother with what society views as that less valuable job, and you have a brother who's really wealthy and has a prestigious job, you can't hold on to bitterness about that either if you want to truly be a follower of Jesus. Instead, we have to view him as what his greater identity is too, as a brother in Christ. First and foremost, the gospel has this vertical dimension to it in which we are united with God in the way that we submit to the kingship of Christ. But it also has a horizontal dimension in which we are united with all those others who have been united with God in submission to Christ the King. And it's crucial to realize that unlike in the Greco-Roman world and even in ours, there's no hierarchy within that horizontal dimension of fellowship. Now that lack of hierarchy, again, doesn't erase social statuses or positions. Instead, what it does is, get this, it calls us to use our social status and our position, whatever we have in the world, as a tool that we employ and gladly give of and use in service to Christ the King. And that's what we all have to do. No matter where we find ourselves on the hierarchy in the world, we are all bringing whatever we have and giving it to Jesus the King. That's what we have to do. Ultimately, what we need to see about our status in Christ is that it defines everything about us. Not only does it define everything about us, it transforms everything about us. It transforms who we are, as we no longer have the same identity as we did before coming to Christ. Our new identity is something that we carry with us in every aspect of our lives, every moment of our days. And such, our status as such, excuse me, our status in Christ also transforms how we act. Not only does it transform who we are, but it affects what we do. As we no longer do the things we did before coming to Christ that don't conform to his example and fall under his kingship. And then finally, our new status in Christ also transforms how we view others who are in Christ. It changes the way we view other Christians. As we let go of the world and how they want to define them or view them based on their social status or circumstances. And we view each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Philemon is a challenging book, as it turns out. <laughs> maybe you're feeling that right now. Maybe you're not. But I can tell you that for sure, I'm preaching this lesson this morning because I need it. I need it so very, very badly. Every single one of these points hits on something that I need to change. And I need to give God control of who I am and what I do in every situation. Because I, I'm realizing there's some areas I've still been holding on to. And I surely need to reevaluate the way that I view my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need to stop letting the world influence the way I view my fellow Christians so much. That's not their job. I need to view all of you and all Christians worldwide as just my brothers and sisters in Christ. It starts and ends with that. So as I humbly consider what needs to change in my life, in light of the gospel and what the Apostle Paul says about it here in this little but powerful letter to Philemon, I invite you to do the same. Consider your life. Is it submitted to King Jesus in every way? The gospel is meant to change us. It's meant to change who we are, how we act, and how we view each other. So let it do that in your life. And you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. This is the pathway of blessing for me, the song says. It's, there is blessing in following Jesus as King. Maybe you won't be blessed in the way the world thinks of blessing. But maybe you'll be blessed in a greater way. So if we change our minds and transform them into the way that Christ wants us to view each other, to view the world, to view blessing, to view everything, then we will truly be blessed. And we know that his promises are true. And we can look forward to being with the Lord eternally one day as well. Well, if you're not a Christian this morning, the gospel call is, is a steep challenge. It's, it's hard uh, to obey the gospel and to truly give everything to Jesus. But as we just talked about, there is great blessing that can be ours if we do. And it's so worth it. I think anyone here this morning who's a Christian would tell you it's worth it. Uh, no, no second guessing about whether that was the right decision or not. So as challenging as it is, we want every single one of you who's not a Christian to consider that. If you are a Christian this morning, again, let's all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ reconsider, have we given everything to Jesus? Do we give every moment to him? Are we Christians no matter where we are? Is that who we are? And how do we live, and does that affect the way we live and how we view each other? 
So I hope these encouragements from the book of Philemon have been helpful to you this morning. If you have a spiritual need this morning, we'd love to help you with that. You can come forward and make that known as we stand and sing.